what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. I'm here with Dr. Scott Gray, who is host of Top Minds. And we both have had amazing founders and CEOs on our podcast. Uh, we are here with L.V. Ray Smith, the co-founder of Pixar, among other companies. And before I formally introduce you, L.V., um, I love to point out some popular episodes uh, on the podcast. And you know, I love talking about the ups and the downs. You know, sometimes we only hear the ups in the media. We like on the podcast to hear about the challenges, the down moments. So one of my favorites was I had the founder of P90X on, and obviously we know they've, you know, had lots of success, but I love when Tony Horton talks about driving cross country and LV, the way he made his food and rent money was as a street mime. So he would put his hat on the street and that's how he made his food and rent money. And actually on the interview, I made him do street miming for me, like, and he actually did. The, another one, the founder of uh, Atari, Nolan Bushnell, you probably know, LV is one of Steve Jobs' mentors. And he talked about on the podcast that Steve Jobs offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000. And he talks about why he said no to that. So that and many more, check out episodes, that and also on Top Minds and Without further ado, I want to introduce L.V. Ray Smith. Uh, he's an American computer scientist, co-founded Lucasfilm's Computer Division and Pixar, participating in the 1980s and 90s expansion of what we know as a computer animation into feature film. This is an epic tale, and he created his first computer graphic in 1965 at New Mexico State. In 1970, he received a Ph.D. in computer science for Stanford University. Um, he uh, was the co-founder and CEO of Altamira Software Corporation, which was eventually purchased by Microsoft. Obviously, co-founder of Pixar, which was eventually purchased by Disney. Lucasfilm, uh, computer division, director of the computer graphics, and so much more. Please, everyone, check out his book, A Biography of the Pixel. And Alvy Ray, thanks for joining us. Very pleased to be here, Jeremy, after all this time. I am so excited. I know Dr. Scott is so excited. And we wanted to just start off with just taking us back to the beginning of Pixar for a second. Well, it's hard to even know where that beginning is. Uh, it's far farther back than most people know, I suspect. Um, I think of the beginning as New York Institute of Technology on Long Island outside of New York City, where, well, first of all, I was at Xerox Park, where my best friend Dick Schaup, we talked about before, uh, had written a paint program and using what I thought were the first color pixels. And when I saw those color pixels and that paint program, I said, that's me. That's, you know, I, already, I, I learned how to paint from an uncle named George Gray, Scott. And he, <laughs> I was a painter, oils and acrylics and so forth. And I was a computer guy. And here it was, the two things I was good at married together, and I knew instantaneously that's what I wanted to do. And I got hired on at Xerox Park during its absolutely fabulous heyday when the personal computer, as we now know it, was invented with uh, Windows-based operating systems and Ethernet and uh, laser printer and, you know, just, just what we have here right in front of me right now. No Zoom yet. Um, but I got fired because Xerox Park decided not to do color. They said, and I went, I said, but you guys own it. You own it completely. That's nuts. And they said, you may be right, Alvy, but it's a corporate decision to go black and white. So I went, oh, okay, bye. And uh, I had cast my lot with an artist friend named David D. Francisco to uh, in a in a proposal to the National Endowment for the Arts, the NEA, we and the idea of the proposal was to exploit this new art medium called raster graphics was what we called it at the time. And uh, so he and I had our, but we needed a frame buffer. Uh, we needed a pixel memory, in other words. And Dick Shop had the first one, and I had just been fired from use of it. So 
our first goal was to get the next, find the next frame buffer, the next pixel memory. And we heard that they were building one at the University of Utah. Evans and Sutherland was building the next frame buffer. So we jumped in my car, David and I did. We drove out to Salt Lake. I've got hair down in my small of my back. David's got hair out to here, electric hair. We tried to act like we weren't artists because <laughs> 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 they're defense department funded, right? They, they said, well, we can't, we can't do you guys here. But there was a rich guy who just came through, Alexander Schur from the New York Institute of Technology on Long Island. And he bought one of everything in sight. And I said, including the frame buffer? Yes, he bought the frame buffer. So that meant this guy was going to have the next frame buffer in the world. Turns out that Martin Newell of, of, teapot, fame, of teapot fame, if computer graphics, the teapot is a holy object, as you probably know, because uh, Martin Newell, an Englishman, had a teapot, and he entered its data into a computer at, I think, at the University of Utah, and that database got passed around from group to group to group. To try, we all tried our algorithms out on the teapot. Oh. Martin Newell Martin Newell says, I'm headed off to uh, uh, New York Tech tomorrow to give uh, the young fellow there who's in charge, Ed Catmull, a, some advice. I'll call you and tell you what I see. When he called me a few days later, his advice was, if I were you, I'd get on the next plane. And that's what Dave and I did. We got ourselves out there. I mean, they don't, they didn't even have any equipment yet, but basically this is a rich man, a crazy rich man. One of the undersung heroes, I think of computer graphics on the fabulous North shore of Long Island mansion after mansion after mansion. He had cobbled together four estates into his campus called the New York Institute of Technology. But the buildings on the campus were mansions. So Turns out the video mansion, video was in one mansion. Computer graphics was in another mansion. My girlfriend lived in a third mansion. David and I lived in a fourth mansion. It, you know, I'd wake a kid from New Mexico. I'd wake up pinching myself. This, is, this can't be true. This, this has <laughs> got to be a movie. <laughs> and this guy was kind of crazy, but he was crazy, crazy good for us. Maybe not for him, but crazy good for us. So one of the first things he did, just to kind of give you a sense of this amazing event, was he came to me one day and he said, we're the best graphics place in the world, aren't we? And I said, yes, we are. He says, how do we stay that way? I said, well, you know this 8-bit frame buffer you bought us, 200, uh, excuse me, 512 by 512 by 8 bits for $80,000, $75, 1975 $1975. If you buy me two more of those, I can gang them together into 24-bit pixels. And I tried to explain to him the difference between 256 colors and 16 million colors. Not knowing whether I was getting through to this guy or not. Because he, he didn't talk like you and I are talking right now. We're just sort of an exchange. Somebody says something, there's a response, there's a give and a take. He just came in talking. And I finally realized that the only way I could, I, I didn't know what to do. So I would just start talking too. <laughs> we're, both, we're, we're talking and I, and all of a sudden I hear my words come out of his mouth. I say, Oh, okay. The thought transferred, but you didn't really know whether it, you know, did he really get the difference between 256 and 16 mega colors? Who knows? Well, a few weeks later, Alex, well, uncle Alex, we called him showed up like four in the morning. And he said, you know what? I bought you five more of those eight-bit thingies, so you'd have two of those twenty-four-bit thingies. In today's dollars, he just said I spent almost two million bucks on you just because you said so. Wow! And we had more memory. We had the first twenty-four-bit pixels in the world, and we went crazy. Uh -huh. So that's why this guy, I think, should figure in more than he does. And that's where I met Ed Catmull. Ed Catmull was already there. They didn't have anything going yet. Alex Schur had a, had a cell animation studio on his campus. They were making Tubby the Tuba, the old-fashioned way with uh, inked lines on celluloid and opaquing from behind and so forth. And his idea, this 
Evans and Sutherland salesman had talked had talked Alex into believing that if he just plugged in these computers, he could fire all the people and dollars would just roll out the other end and make his movie cheap. We would say, please don't say that, Alex. Don't say that. We don't know. We can't replace the art. There's not. We we still can't replace the art. 2021. There's you can't do that. But it was clear that our job was to figure out what the old-fashioned animators did and somehow bring the computer into that world. So I wrote a paint program for the backgrounds, and Ed wrote uh, an in-betweening program. And let's see, I did a, ten, a fill fill program to, uh, where you would uh, choose a color and touch a enclosed area, and it would just fill with that color. It's the digital equivalent of opaquing in the cell animation mm -hmm. business. So we did all this, and luckily, we never got involved with Tubby the Tube itself, which turned out to be a total disaster. Be you know, and I, I could go in great detail, but basically, after four or five years of this amazing place, this heaven on earth place, it became clear to us that Alex sure really didn't have it. And, and by the way, watching these guys, these old animators, is when we got the idea that, hey, we could be the first people in the world to make a completely digital movie. That's when we had the vision. So 1975, sort of not knowing, not knowing it's going to take 20 years to get there. Toy Story came out in 95. So, and there's a lot that happened in between there, of course. Um, but we had we'd gotten our start in this royal way. And, and then um, one day I got a call from Francis Coppola, and the next day we got a call from George Lucas. Now, the guy representing from their people, not themselves. I was going to say, that's a good call. Those are <laughs> <all> good <people. laughs> the guy, the person representing Francis Coppola, I had no respect for. And I realized that if that's the personnel he was using, then it was not going to work. Mm. And, and sure enough, that team coked out later. But George Lucas seemed to be a really sober person with his feet flat on the ground. He may not have been as, he was nowhere nearly as dazzling a director, of course, as Francis Coppola, but he, he would, we trusted that he would get there. So, um, we we asked them we asked them to uh, send a representative out secretly because Alex Sure was litigious. He had already uh, gone after Jim Clark, who was uh, famous as the Netscape founder, and we knew that he would he he could be nasty. So we wanted to be sure that we did everything clean and by the book, and there was no ambiguity. So. Uh, we, and we also wanted Lucasfilm to see what we were used to. We didn't want to go downhill. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is the lifestyle that we're used to. So you better build us a mansion. Yeah. And... We've got a mansion. And, you know, like <laughs> this is heaven. <laughs> so awesome. we weren't going to insist on mansions, but we just sort of wanted people to be aware that we, this is our, we, we've got the best. We don't want to go downhill. Okay. So <laughs> they, they said, oh, yeah, we'll be anonymous. They weren't. The, the, they sent out Richard Edlin, who's the head of special effects at Industrial Light and Magic, the special effects branch of Lucasfilm. He had a giant Star Wars belt buckle on, just giant. <laughs> Some secret, right? So <laughs> oddly, uh, enough, oddly enough, nobody picked up on that belt buckle. Ed and I are sitting there just sweating bullets, right? <laughs> And we, you know, had a great demo, and uh, Ed and I got invited out to Lucasfilm in L.A. Where we, so after their visit, Ed and I, first off, we went off campus. We went and we rented this giant black, those old cast iron typewriters, you know, that I learned how to type on. Uh, because we knew there was a, a mole at New York Tech. We couldn't use a word processor like Jim Clark had done or it'd be reported somehow to mm -hmm. Alex Schur. 
So we went off, we rented this giant old typewriter, went off to, I think it was Ed's garage in, and spent hours composing what we knew would be the letter of our lifetime. Yeah, this is what we can offer, da, 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 da. And um, unfortunately, we didn't save a copy of that letter. Um, I was going to say, you know, <laughs> Alvy, we were saying before we hit record, my pitch to you is your next book, okay? So people should obviously check out a biography of the pixel. Your next book should be the letter of our lifetime. And that's the true story, the <laughs> behind the scenes story of Allie Ray Smith and Pixar. By the so, way, this is all, this is all in the uh, a biography of the pixel. A biography of the pixel is a large book. It's not the story of Pixar, but the story of Pixar is in there. And it's yeah. not the story of computer graphics, but the story of computer graphics is in there. Yeah. Et cetera. So I had to, um, the book is about digital light, namely all the pictures made of pixels for whatever reasons. It's a vast field. In fact, all nearly all pictures in the world today are digital, are part of digital light. Zoom is part of digital light. In fact, because of the digital explosion, nearly all pictures that have ever existed are digital light. That's the, my, that's the topic of my book, but it's so large, I have to kind of, I had to build an armature from which I could hang the pieces. And the armature really? is the story of, of getting to the first movies. Yeah. So what okay. ever the letter of our lifetime. So, so this letter worked. Uh, Ed went it. So our plan was to get Ed hired in at Lucasfilm. We, David D. Francisco and I, my, the artist friend that's been with me all along, uh, laundered ourselves, we called it, to JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, so that we could not be accused of having raided New York Tech. So we did that, got Ed in place, and as soon as he could, he pulled us in from JPL, uh, made me the director of computer graphics. Meanwhile, Ed was the head of audio editing, video editing, the whole thing, computer graphics and a games project. Okay, we thought that George was hiring us to be in his movies, but that was mis a mistake. Somehow that, oh yeah, we can build hardware and software for you. That's, that's the dues we're happy to pay, but we want to be in the movies. You know, we want to make pictures in the movies. So I started hiring like crazy, just the hottest talent in the world. And everybody thought that's what we were going to be doing at Lucasfilm. So I got Lauren Carpenter and Bill Reeves and, and Tom Porter and Tom Dub, all these stars, these geniuses. And was waiting for George to show up. And he didn't. He never showed up. And all of a sudden I went, oh, my gosh. Now, I guess I should say, you know, the first Star Wars had a piece by Larry Cuba, one of our colleagues in it. It was black and white line drawing. But it was computer graphics. We thought George got it about computer graphics. No. He didn't get it. And it suddenly dawned on me. He didn't get it. What are we going to do? Well, that's when um, Paramount came to the rescue with uh, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. They came and hired ILM, Industrial Light and Magic, to do special effects for Star Trek II. Not George's Star Wars movies, the Star Trek franchise. And they wanted to put some to this newfangled computer graphics in Star Trek too. So the guys at ILM, whom they were talking to, said, well, we don't do that. I think the, I think the new guy's next door. I think that's what they do. So they called me over and explained to me this notion of, uh, oh, they wanted to, they called it the Genesis effect. It was the uh, story element in Star Trek II, an effect that caused death, death to become alive instantaneously. So they proposed that uh, we have a, an aquarium with a, a rock floating in it that somehow got covered with moss. And I'm sitting there going, what? And I said, do you guys have any idea what we can do in computer graphics? And they went, no. <laughs> So I said, let me go home overnight and I'll design a shop for you that'll satisfy your, your storyboard needs. 
and it's actually something we can do. And they said, okay. And I walked out of there, you know, about 10 feet off the floor because I knew I had just been given the chance to design a shot in a major motion picture that was going to be successful. So I was up all night, as you might imagine, storyboarding. <laughs> and I, I had Lauren Carver on fractals. I had Bill Reese on particle systems. I had Tom Duff on bump mapping and so forth. I just, I took this rock band and I designed a storyboard that f fit the Paramount needs and um, with what we had. Oh, by the way, before I left that room, I said, you know what? We can't do movie resolution yet. This is the bad old days, right? We can only do video resolution. They said, that's fine. This is going to be a video demo to Admiral Kirk. I went, great, we can do that. And that's what we did. And that's the Genesis demo. So when I hauled the team together, I said, you know, this is our big break. We're finally going to have a shot at the big screen. This is the first time out our group gets to be on the big screen together. And we'll do a great bang up job for Paramount. We'll make everybody in the theater happy. We'll make Paramount happy. But what this really is, is a 60 second commercial to George Lucas. Mm -hmm. So he'll know what the hell he's got. And I knew one thing about George, I, I can't figure out how I knew this when I look back, but I knew maybe one of his D TDs had told me, uh, George never loses track of the camera. And if you ever try to watch a movie that way, basically the director has failed. It, it means you haven't been sucked into the emotion. If you're following the cameraman, you're not sucked into the emotion. Somehow, George, he must be able to do both. Do the emotion and track the camera because he always tracks the camera. Knowing that, I said, we're going to put a camera shot in here that will blow his socks off. No, He'll know that no real camera could possibly have made it. And it won't be gratuitous computer graphics 101 wowie zowie move. It'll make narrative sense to the Star Trek story. And that's what we did. We designed this very elaborate camera move. The camera's spinning, and jerking, and moving, and whipping around and going up. Sure enough, the day after the premiere, George stepped one foot into my office, kind of a shy guy in my opinion, and he said, great camera move. And he was out of there. He got it. And sure enough, he worked us very slightly into Return of the Jedi. And more importantly, he told his good buddy Steven Spielberg about us, and the word started to spread. So that, that that's where we got the you know the group that became Pixar. That's where we that's that was our initiation into the big screen. So, Albie, a quick question about that. Um, obviously, like, uh, you saw the opportunity. You knew what to do. Uh, how did you learn storyboarding and how to do such a cool camera angle? Uh, did you have experience in movie making, or how, how did you know how to do all that stuff? Well, that's, very, that's interesting, Scott. Nobody's ever asked me that. Um, I was a movie addict, um, not knowing that it would matter later in my life. As far as drawing, I had been drawing and painting oil. I told you about painting oils and acrylics. Yeah. And I was, I, I drew, I knew how to draw. So I still have those original storyboards. I'd be embarrassed to show them to you, but you oh, know, I could, I could do the storyboards. And I, I did like, I think six panels for this, for the Genesis demo storyboards. And it was yeah. sort of like, you know, zoom in on this planet. The idea was a moonlight planet that would, uh, we would throw something at it. And I use terms like something at it. Chaos would happen, kind of fuzzy, whatever that was going to be. And the camera pull back would zoom out, revealing an Earth like planet. That was, it was really crude. But I landed the job. So, yeah. And you got George to pop in and say, great job. I mean, that's you can't ask <laughs> yeah. better than that. Man. <laughs> yeah, it worked. It worked. Uh, also, I just got to exercise this this amazing group of geniuses that had accumulated there, uh, who, who all became Pixar. You know, that was that was that was the fundamental group. Uh, 
So we would have happily gone on there, I guess, for who knows how long. Um, but we didn't really, Ed and I had grown up with enamored by character animation. He in Utah and I in New Mexico would watch the, the uh, Walt Disney show and Walt would tell us how they do sell animation. So we were in a you know, character animation, not special effects. Genesis demo with special effects. That's okay, but we wanted to do characters. So I remember we came back from the SIGGRAPH is the big annual computer graphics conference where we show off to all our peers and colleagues. And uh, at the 1983, uh, coming back from the 1983 SIGGRAPH on the airplane, Ed and I decided at the 1984 SIGGRAPH, a year hence, we would announce to the world that we did character animation. So I immediately, on the airplane, pulled out my green engineering pad and started storyboarding again. And I storyboarded what eventually became Andre and Wally B. Um, which, yep. tell you the truth, I thought I was going to be the animator. I didn't know yet that I wasn't good enough. I, I thought if I can draw, I can make things move. I can, an no, it's that animators are of a class of their own. Um, as I now know well, but I didn't know well then. And luckily I got saved by getting the chance to hire John Lasseter. And, um, Ed and I had so, met him. Yeah. Uh, Alvy, I know that, uh, uh during your time at, at New York Tech and some of the time at Lucasfilm, uh, as, as Jeremy said, you know, I'm a big Disney guy. I, I, I've read that you and Ed would take these secret trips to Disney. Uh, yeah. what, what were you guys trying to find out? Like, who did you meet? Like, how did that all roll into this? So we about? were, we were always, uh, yeah, Ed and I made trips to Disney pilgrimages is how I think of them. To <laughs> to the you know to the holy spot uh, uh, all through New York Tech and Lucasfilm days because especially at New York Tech we said why is this why are we here I mean this is beautiful and luxurious but this this is not it should be Disney doing this right uh, and we would go out there and show them the latest stuff that we knew how to do and basically say are you guys aren't you interested in this and every year we got sort of the same thing. It was like can you, some VP would come in who didn't have a clue, and he would say, can you boys do bubbles? <laughs> no, we, not that year. We couldn't do bubbles. I mean, they didn't get, a, <laughs> get the notion that computers can do anything, right? You just had to wait for to them to get fast enough. So, yeah. But even though we got blown, I mean, this is when Disney was being run by a football player uh, married to Walt Disney's daughter, and uh, th that management level just didn't have a clue. Now, the technical level knew exactly who we were and what we had to offer. We made friendships during this period that lasted forever and, you know, eventually paid off by us becoming part of Disney. Took way did longer. You get to, did you get to meet guys like Frank and Ollie and the nine old men and all yeah, those guys? Frank, well, Frank and Ollie. Yep, absolutely. Uh, got to meet Frank and Ollie. He was like, talk about being in That's heaven. Terrible. Here's these two, two yokels from the Southwest at Disney, <laughs> and we got to meet these guys. And they, they were, they, we showed them our 3D stuff. It blew everybody's mind to see these 3D renderings, but they didn't know what to do with them. And we, we were, mm. the, the computers weren't fast enough to have done anything really exciting yet. But the the young the youngsters could see there was something in there, right? And uh, that the, they they all sh expressed excitement about the three D, you know, the three D models that were being rendered. And it's Frank and Ollie. It, by the way, Frank and Ollie remained friends until their deaths in their nineties with with uh, with me and with 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 Ed. Uh, wonderful, wonderful two gentlemen. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I've got their personally signed, you know, Art of Disney book here. It's just oh my gosh, that's yeah, awesome. they're, they're 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 special, they're special. Uh, but nothing ever happened there. I, although I remember, um, 
people said, you know, if Ub Iwerks was still here, you guys would be in in a moment. So we learned right away that Ub Iwerks was like this secret uh, god at Disney. So I since in my book, I point out that I think Ub basically was, it should be given more credit at Disney than he gets. So I try to fix that a little bit in my book. Um, yeah. So during the Lucasfilm days, we, we would still go down there. Uh, and, and one of these, that, because you just, you know, we wanted them to be aware of what we were doing. And so, and let's see. The things, well, I, what I wanted to get at with John Laster, we, we uh, on one of these visits, we met this kid, John Lasseter. He was working at Disney. And he excited. It turns out Ed and I had met him twice before, but we didn't remember him at all. It was this particular visit at Disney where he hauled, John hauled Ed and me down into the Disney archives and said, what do you want to see? And I said, anything? He said, yeah, anything. I said, well, I'd like to see the dancing hippo from Fantasia, Preston Blair. He says, okay. And he goes over and he looks up on a chart, you know, ch -ch -ch -ch. goes over, pulls out this manila envelope and thumbs through Preston Blair's original Hyacinth the Hippo dancing. I was wow. in the hawk heaven. I taught myself from Preston Blair's book, How to Animate. Then he said, what next? And I went, anything? <laughs> you know, I still couldn't believe it. <laughs> he, he says, yeah, I'll be anything. I said, okay. Uh, the, 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 pink elephant scene from Dumbo and like that we're starting to bond here you know so yeah. but we couldn't touch John because he was working for Disney a few couple of months later Ed calls me he's down on the Queen Mary now docked as a convention center in Long Beach the old Queen Mary mm -hmm. and he we were having our daily business meeting and he said oh I just chat with John Lester and he's He's not a Disney anymore. I said, get off the phone right now. Go hire him. <laughs> <laughs> and Ed immediately knew that was the right idea. And of course, did just that. And so that's how we got John Lasseter. John had been fired, but he, would, he was so embarrassed. He never told us. We didn't care. You know, he was, here's this world-class animator. And he, so wow. anyhow, we, hired, we couldn't hire him because George didn't believe in it, that we could do animation. So we hired him as a user interface designer. <laughs> <laughs> and he said he's and meanwhile i'm starting to work on andre and wally b with my my crude storyboards and he takes a look at him he says can i give you a suggestion and i went john that's why you're here absolutely well he basically turned it around made andre a much nicer character than i had him added the wally b character and you know basically made it made it and animated it and turned it into it's still it looks really crude these days but it was a leap up. Nobody had seen anything like that. It was kind of the first time out on full 3D rendered animation with a with a natural born animator at the helm instead of a guy like me who just thought he could animate. But what year was that, John? That, when did John join you guys? What year was that? Well, I was 83, I believe. 80, uh, okay. Andre and Wally came out in 84. He wasn't there in 82 when we did the uh, Genesis demo. So I'm guessing 83. Okay. Um, so th there we had it. We had our missing ingredient. Finally, we had all the technical stuff. We had the artistic stuff now, and we could start dreaming big. Um, meanwhile, George and Marshall Lucas get divorced. And talk about it, monkey wrench. I mean, we had always been working in a research lab for the man, right? We weren't we weren't business types. Uh, we, we didn't think about money. We Alex sure wouldn't even let us see the money. We had no idea where the money was coming from at New York Tech. I still don't know where that money came from. <laughs> even though I even though I tried to find out for my book. I found out a lot, but not that. Um, well, in California, community property say half the fortune goes away overnight to the, each spouse. Overnight, George. So I, I went into Ed and I said, Ed, George is going to fire us. He can't afford us anymore. He just lost half his fortune. He never really understood who we were. He's 
he's going to have to fire us or let us go. And, and Ed grew up religious and I grew up religious. So I said, it would be a sin to let this world-class group of talent disperse. Let's start a company. Now this is two nerds talking, right? Let's start a company to give them a home. So we, we've got to hold this group together. Even, even though we weren't ready to make movies yet, computers weren't ready yet. Moore's law wasn't there yet. And Ed agreed. And we went across the street to a bookstore in Marin County called a uh, clean, well-lighted place for books and bought four how to start company books. I bought two, Ed bought two. <laughs> the damnedest thing is that it worked, didn't it? But <laughs> it, it took a lot of luck. It took, <laughs> so we wrote up, we, I, I guess it's, uh, I should tell you that um, the reason we knew at this point that, and, and by the way, Lucasfilm was all for starting this company because they would get a piece of it and they, that, you know, that's one way of unloading the, the computer division, part of the computer division. So, um, meanwhile, a Japanese firm, and this is one of the parts of the story that a lot of people don't know, a large Japanese printing company called Shogakan came to approach me to make the first digital movie, Our Dream, based on the Monkey King characters that I don't know whether you're familiar with the Monkey King stories, but most uh, children in Asia are raised on these stories. Hundreds, if not thousands of stories about the, the Monkey King, who's like, he's like a god, but he's not old enough to really be wise enough to be a god, so he's always screwing up. I mean, that's the basic gist of the stories. Well, I had been turned on to, to the Monkey King stories at New York Tech years ago, years earlier, by my good friend, Lance Williams. And then I went to China in 1978 and came back loaded with Monkey King books. I had, I brought back 12 books, I think, of stories and artwork based on the Monkey King. I was a total addict. So when this, so when this um, printing company came to me and wanted to make the first movie based on the Monkey King, I said, oh, this is one of those cases where I've been grabbed by the neck. This is where you're going next, buddy. Um, and we started to work on it. Storyboards, marketing, uh, uh, marketing reports, uh, holding meetings with the Japanese at fancy resorts in California. John started doing character sketches, character sketches for the, the, the Monkey King hero. Finally, it came to the point where I said, okay, Alvy, you've got to figure out how much to charge these guys. Nobody had ever costed an animated movie before, right? This kind of animation. So I sharpened my pencil. I sat down and I've calculated everything I now knew and came to the miserable conclusion that Moore's Law wasn't there yet. We needed another. My version of Moore's Law, by the way, is everything good about computers gets better by an order of magnitude every five years. 10x every five. It's an awesome mm -hmm. law. Okay. It's the dynamo behind the whole modern world. We needed another order of magnitude out of Moore's law. In other words, we need another five years. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do for five years with our company? Cause we can't make movies yet. Well, we had built a, a computer called the Pixar image computer for George uh, to to simulate the optical printer. That was one of our tasks for him. So we had a hard, we had a prototype and it said, what shall we do? I said, oh, the only thing that makes any sense at all for 40 people, which is what we were, is to turn that prototype into a product and sell it. That'll be our company. It'll be a hardware company. Now I look back in total disbelief that we got to that conclusion. We didn't know a damn thing about it, right? Hardware, sales, manufacturing, none of that. We, we, we just knew sort of research department level versions of that. 
And here we were. So we went out and tried to raise money on this idea. We talked to 45 different outfits, 35 venture capital firms and investment banks turned us down. We, we were lucky because since we were Lucasfilm, we were kind of sexy and they would let us in the door to give us, give a spiel, but they all said, this doesn't make sense to us. Bye. Cause you're ahead of your time. I mean, well, is that why it was more like we didn't fit their idea of a seed startup, right? We had 40 people. We had a prototype already built and, and they couldn't see where it was really going to go, even though we tried our damnedest to sell it. Um, and we were also inexperienced, right? We were, we weren't business guys. Yeah. So, so then we decided to talk to, and, and we were being advised all along by Lucasfilm business people because they get a piece of whatever happens, right? So we started talking to, we decided we would do it, we would form a strategic partnership with some large corporation. Well, eight of those, we, we talked to 10, eight of them blew us away. But General Motors did not. And Phillips of the Netherlands did not. And the two of them almost closed the deal with us. Almost closed the deal with us. We got so close that we were, we were up, uh, up above Grand Central Station in Manhattan. I think it was in the Phillips building. All, you know, there are 20 people around the table. It was one of the most stressful days of my life. Four parties at the table half lawyers, our future on the line. By the end of that, that stressful day, everybody's saying yes and shaking hands. And normally in the business world, that's a done deal. The lawyers write up what's just been agreed to and you sign a paper and you're done. But in this particular case, all right. We were dealing with the branch of General Motors that was run by H. Ross Perot. Remember this character? Yeah. H. Ross Perot? Sure. Okay. H. Ross Perot, electronic data systems had been folded into General Motors, and that was the division that was getting ready to fund us, along with Phillips of, of the Netherlands. Um, the day that we had this successful meeting in Manhattan, I think a day or two earlier, H. Ross Perot had uptown in Manhattan at the GM building, blown away the board of directors by insulting them, of General Motors, by insulting them, accusing them of being stupid by investing $5 billion in Hughes tools, as I recall. Basically, that news broke overnight in the Wall Street Journal, and it was clear that anything having to do with General Motors and H. Ross Perot was dead. And of course, our deal was right there in that crack. Wow. So overnight, what we thought was our last great hope got tossed. Ed and I are frantic at this point, right? We're out of options. Lucasfilm is just sick to death of this whole thing. They're about ready to close us down. So what we had this, this idea in the limo, coming back from Manhattan, you're going to the airport from this meeting in Manhattan. We had this idea. It was a Hail Mary idea. Let's call Steve Jobs. So I, sh I should back up just a little bit. One of the uh, financial people we had talked to was Steve Jobs. He had been fired from uh, 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 Apple, and he called Ed and me and our CFO down to his mansion near Woodside, California. And I remember sitting out on the grass and he presented this notion that he would buy us from Lucasfilm and run us as his next company. And we went, no, we, we, we don't, we want to run our own company, but we'll accept your money. And he said, okay. And he went to Lucasfilm and proposed a, a, a level of capitalization that was about a half of what General Motors and Phillips were proposing. 
Now, General Motors and Phillips looked like it was a done deal. Lucasfilm basically laughed him out of the office. I, you know, not really, but they paid him no mind. So, okay, that deal's fallen through. The General Motors deal is falling through. Dad and I are frantic. We, we said, let's call George, uh, let's call Steve and just say, make exactly the same offer again, the one at half the valuation of, of the General Motors deal. Ed and I didn't care. We just wanted to be funded, right? We think Lucasfilm is at the end of their tether and they'll go for it. Well, that's what happened. And that's how we got Steve Jobs as our venture capitalist. He did not buy us. That was part of the Steve Jobs myth. He never bought us. He funded a spin-out company of which he owned a majority. And the employees owned the rest. And we were egalitarian. Every employee owned a piece of the rest. So Ed and I and Steve were the board of directors of this company. And uh, pretty quickly we learned never to let Steve in the building because he just blew everything apart. He, <laughs> he, um, he, he has this charisma, as everybody knows. And basically it's a, it's a nice way of saying he could just lie through his teeth and, and people just believe it's true. And he does it in such a classy way that, so the first time I got a sense of this was I'm, I'm Pixar's first meeting, right? We hauled all the employees in, we bring in the chief investor and Steve gives a talk. And also I look at my employees and they're all looking up at him with this love in their eyes. And I'm going, oh my God, what's going on? That's, <laughs> that's weird. You know, he's grabbed, he's grabbed their souls somehow. <laughs> so, and it, and then after he left, it took like two weeks for Ed and I to go around and get everybody back into the real world. My engineers, these hardcore engineers that said, you know, it'll take us a month, Alby, to build this board for the Pix for the, you know, the, the manufactured version of the Pixar image computer. Well, they thought they could do it in a week because Steve had said so. And I said, can you do it in a week? Well, no. I said, please tell us your best. Forget what that guy said. Tell us your best stuff. It's your it's a month, right? He says, yes, it's a month. Okay, please come. So it took like two weeks. So we just said, no, don't let this guy in the building. He screws everything up for we don't know what purpose, you know, his own whatever. Uh, glorification is what it seemed to me. And uh, luckily, he had started Next by then, hour and a half away. So Ed and I made sure that all the meetings were held at Next. So, you know, we happily go there to keep him out of our building. Um, it, so, you know, in the sense of the true story, of, you know, Steve's version of all this is when he, he saw this struggling hardware company and saved it. No, he didn't. He was a hardware guy. He invested in a hardware company. He was, a board, he was on the board, and he could not save. Our hardware company, we would have failed three or four times if we had any other investor but Steve Jobs. We ran out of money. Classic version of failure. Steve would come in and just tear Ed and me apart, but he would always write a check. He did not want to be embarrassed that the second thing he did after Apple was a failure. Mm -hmm. So bottom line is, for all the wrong reasons, he kept us alive. His version is that he had that vision all along. He's going to be this movie guy. He never had that vision. He never <laughs> talked movies at all. He was a hardware guy. <laughs> he would have he would have sold us to anybody for fifty million bucks just to. By the way, he eventually put fifty million in, uh, which is sort of half of his Apple fortune, um, to keep us alive. But we were failing still. What saved us was Moore's law came along. Gave us that extra order of magnitude, right on key, right on cue. Disney knocks on our door and says, let's make that movie you guys always wanted to make. We'll pay for it. Disney saved Steve Jobs' – saved him. And Steve, for his part, did a brilliant thing. I mean, he was a businessman. He realized that he could take Pixar public on just the promise of Toy Story, even though there's no money in the bank at all. 
he could use his skills selling stories, which he's really good at, to take Pixar public. And he did that and became a billionaire overnight. So it looks like a really genius move, but it was just sheer luck, frankly, that saved him all along. That's the true story of Pixar. <laughs> Um, another, another part of it that might surprise you is that I spun out, uh, Steve and I had a horrible time. We didn't like each other at all. And, um, eventually, uh, after I knew that, um, Toy Story is going to happen, I got the hell out of there because I couldn't stand having this guy in my life. And I started another company called Altamira Software. Guess who one of the investors was? Steve Jobs. You know, <laughs> we couldn't stand each other, but he came through with the money twice for me. So, <laughs> so he, he knew that he would get his investment back and it was a good thing. So I don't have to work with them, but uh, it's boy. It. LV, I'm curious, so, you know, with, with Steve Jobs in the whole story, I've heard you tell before, what was so sacred about the whiteboard? Because it seemed oh, like that was, that was a turning point. <laughs> that was the point when I realized I, could, I couldn't be around this guy anymore. Um, yeah, I, I grew up in a Southern Baptist. I'm a total non-believer now, but I grew up Southern Baptist, three, church three times a week. And we have these evangelists come through once a year. They'd throw up a tent outside of town. And these evangelists would come in and they would preach and preach and preach and for long. All thousands of people in my hometown would be marching up to the front of the tent to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And I'm sitting there going, what's going on? Somehow that guy has manipulated the brains of all these people is what it seemed like to me. So, in other words, I grew up spotting these evangelists. I didn't care what they called themselves. I could spot them a mile away. Steve Jobs was one of those guys. Right? He could just start preaching and get this sing song going for a long time. Like my employees are all in love with him and they would be marching to the front of the church to accept him as their Lord and Savior. So he would, so quickly I figured out the way, you know, his techniques. One of them was uh, he would, uh, he, he, to start a meeting, he would say something absolutely outrageous. And in that moment, your mouth's hanging open, he's grabbed the agenda. So we started advising everybody. Whatever Steve says first, just just ignore it. Absolutely <laughs> ignore it. He's looking for for a grab. Don't let him grab it. Stick to your agenda. Uh, and I would often say, Steve, that's not right. He would make some outrageous. I said, no, that's not right. And I, I didn't like the role, but he would, you know, he would accept it and say, well, what's right? And I'd give the true version of whatever it was that he Overclaim until it got to the point where, whenever he would make a claim, he would whip his eyes over to see how I was going to take it or, or not. That was our relationship. It wasn't wasn't very fun, but at least I got to speak the truth. And uh, until this one day, the famous whiteboard day, we were at a board meeting at Next. And uh, we had a couple of two or three vice presidents there because we're getting larger by now. And um, the same thing happened. He, he came in, he said something. Oh, I know what it was. He said, he started busting me and Ed because we were late on one of our boards. And I said, but, but Steve, you're late on one of your boards. It's like, I mean, how, how can you bust us for something you yourself can't do, right? It's just, this is not right. Whatever, whatever, I don't know what the difference was, but he went nuts. He went crazy. He's, by the way, he always positioned himself in front of the whiteboard with colored pants, and he would leap up and illustrate on the whiteboard. No, and everybody knew they, they weren't allowed at the whiteboard. That was Steve's, an unwritten, and I'm a kind of guy that just can't stand unwritten rules. It's like, come, what? You're just a guy like me. What is this? You know, I'll respect you for your genius and your business human, but not just because you're you. Um, so he was standing at the whiteboard and I was sitting down when he, he 
this time he didn't accept my version of things. And he marched over till he's standing, you know, above me and in my face. And he starts insulting my Texas accent. I mean, this is street yard bully stuff. It has nothing to do with content of argument, right? It's street yard bully. You're a frightened little boy. Can't talk straight, you know, that kind of stuff. And nobody had ever talked to me that way before in my entire life. And I went crazy too. And I leapt up literally in his face. We're screaming at each other, full bull rage, that far apart. Mm. And in that moment, I knew exactly the right thing to do. I physically brushed past him and wrote on the whiteboard. <laughs> and he said, you, you, you can't do that. And I said, what, right on the whiteboard? And he marched out. And from that moment, I knew. So, yeah. so, so one of the, it took a while for all of this to register because this is a very emotional moment, right? So I knew, I started to register how, how stark the moment was when uh, our, Bill Adams, our VP of sales from Texas, reached across the table and took my hand in, in a two-handed handshake. He took my hand in both his hands. He had never done that before. And he said, only a guy from Texas could have done that. I, I knew that wasn't probably wasn't a compliment. Oh, man. <laughs> he was probably saying, you poor bugger. <laughs> and then he did it again out in the parking lot. So somewhere in there I went, geez, that, that, that was it. Now, he couldn't fire me. Steve couldn't fire me. Ed was the, was the head of the company. And Ed wasn't about to fire me, but it became clear to me that I had to get, I had to get the, that guy completely out of my existence. He was poisoned. Uh, it, and, how did, you, did you just resign then from there? Or how no, you... no, I was there. I was there for another year figuring okay. out what to do. Uh, I didn't yeah. want to leave until I knew that Toy Story is going to happen. That was our, that was our vision. Yeah. So I, you know, we, the, there was a, so, so we, you know, even though we got the offer to, to, to make the movie from Disney, John Lester didn't want to work for them. They had fired him. Right. Well, Ed and I, oh, you know, here's our big okay. break. <laughs> so, so, um, Katzenberg called a meeting in Burbank just to address this problem. He knew what the problem was. He knew that John Lester thought he was a tyrant. Uh, Katzenberg was a tyrant. So he called a meeting in Burbank. He invited. So Ed and I went down. John Lester and Bill Reeves, the, our, our high power technical duo, went down and artistic duo. And, and, and Steve Joss went along to check out his fellow tyrant, I think. And uh, we're sitting in the room, and Katzenberg starts off by surprising us. He says, You know, I tried to hire John away from you guys, and he won't leave. We didn't know that that he had tried to steal John. So I'm willing to do a deal with Pixar just to get at John's talent. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do here, John, I know you think I'm a tyrant, blah, blah, blah. But what we're going to do here is Jobs and I are going to leave the room and you guys from Pixar can go hang out with guys from Disney for hours if you want to and just ask anything you want and find out what it's really like to work here and with me. And see if you can't change your mind. So he well, must have been pretty confident then. Well, I, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, it was one thing was for sure. He and Steve Jobs were two of the same kind of guy. It was kind of astonishing. Um, they, uh, so that's what we did. We spent all day talking, talking. About the end of the day, John Lester and I are walking. We're out in front of the rest of the group. We're walking together side by side toward the rental car to take us to the Burbank airport and fly home. And I said, so what do you think? And John says, I can do it. And at that wow. point, I knew it was, you know, there still had to be a negotiated and all that, but I knew it was going to happen. And that's when I felt free to leave. And I crafted, uh, I spun out Altamira software from the side. Amazing. Yeah. Very proud of, you know, very proud of Pixar, regardless of the 
nastiness along the way. Yeah, a beautiful you, thing came out of it. And yeah, all that you went through to to do that, and um, I mean, just amazing. I mean, I still remember November '95 going to see Toy Story. That I mean, that was it was, was world it, changing. No one a, ever did anything like it. It was a mind flipper, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I literally remember remember going. Just amazing. So I went to the screening, and Jobs and I encountered each other at the screening, uh, and he made some kind of, oh, when are you going to come back and join us, Alan? That is such a bo- bogus. He had he no more wants to get around there. <laughs> Total phoniness. So, you know, that's what happened. Um, it's what it took to make it happen. Um, I'm so pleased that um, – that Pixar happened. I mean, it was, we, we didn't know we were starting Pixar, right? We were just keeping the team together to make the first movie. Well, we've made dozens of the first movies now, so to speak. So I've got that story in the book. And I also have it intertwined with the uh, stories of DreamWorks and Blue Sky because we kind of all came alive at the same time. Just different, mm-hmm. interla- different interlacings of the same, same forces at work. And I try to give lots, lots of players some visibility. That'll be a question. Um, so so I, when you I, spell I, it out, go ahead. I don't cover the whiteboard in my book. Uh, I thought uh, uh, Walter Isaacson covered it just fine in his Steve Jobs book. I'm not going to beat people up with that again. <laughs> with Ultimera software, what was your, when you spun it out, what was the vision at the time? Can well, you talk about this, a little bit of the evolution of it. Well, the Alpha Channel, one of the inventions that we made along the way was the Alpha Channel. Ed and I invented it at New York Tech in the 70s, about 77 or so. Uh, The reason we could come up with a fourth channel was we had more memory than anybody in the world. And it was easy in that context to say, oh, let's just add a fourth channel. No, everybody else was just... They didn't even have RGB yet, right? They didn't have 24 bits yet. Well, we had RGB. And we had, by that time, we had 18 frame buffers and we could cobble them together. We just said, to solve that problem, let's just throw a fourth channel at it. Boom, we solved the problem. It turned out to be pretty tri- trivial. And uh, we didn't, I tell you the truth, it didn't dawn on me for decades how profound alpha was, uh, especially when you tied into an, alge- an algebra into it invented by our colleagues, Tom Porter and Tom Duff. And the four of us got an Academy Award for all that, Technical Academy Award, SciTech Award. Uh, and but I still was, a, it finally dawned on me that what the Alpha Channel had really done was overthrown the tyranny of the rectangle in pictures. You can now have pixel pictures that weren't rectangular. Mm. And from that flowed the idea for this company, Altamira Software. And as soon as I got it in the marketplace, Microsoft snapped it up. Mm. How's that working with, uh, with Microsoft? How's it, excuse me, ask again. So how is that working with Microsoft? Oh, I, I was, was less than my, much to my surprise, I loved being at Microsoft after hearing how awful it was from uh, Steve Jobs. <laughs> uh, you know, I'd heard everything I heard about Microsoft turned out not to be true, that they uh, weren't original. They never tested anything. They had lousy programmers. All bogus. They had, I've met some of the best programmers in my life there. Whenever they built a product on top of what I brought them, they tested from the very get-go. They you know, I did not, I would not want to compete against their software team, man, they are sharp. So yeah. I, I didn't get, I didn't get to do what I thought I had. They bought my company and I thought they wanted me to build a Photoshop eater, which I could have done. But the last thing uh, Microsoft wanted was to be seen as yet again, the big ogre who's trying to outcompete in this case, Adobe. So they turned my products capabilities way down too far yeah. down in my opinion well i'm gonna i'm gonna go way back right now because uh so 
I, I feel like in, I've studied Pixar and Disney and all this, and I've learned some pretty interesting business lessons, you know, in studying what you guys did. And I, one of the most interesting things that I, that I found was um, I read that Ed, when he first met you, he didn't want to hire you because he really thought that you would basically take him over. You'd be able to take his job because I don't, he just saw something in you, but he decided, he said, no, I need people better than me. And so he decided to hire you and you keep talking about talent, keeping that team. And I feel like you guys just were so good at, I mean, for Ed to take that risk, right? to hire a guy better than him, so to speak. And you may not see it that way, but I, I, I don't that. see it. I don't see it that way. And I have seen interviews where he said that. Um, and it's true that Ed and I always made a point of hiring smarter than ourselves. Um, it's easy to say that, by the way. It's a lot easier to say it than to do it because for if you have a a, a, a place that's got heavy politics, then – people will play politics against you. We never had that. We had a wonderful collegial group of people forever. Uh, yeah. We just didn't think that way about who's going to take something away from. And the, in the early days, it was, it was really Alex sure that hired me, as I recall it. Uh, I, I remember showing up there at uh, New York tech and showing Alex sure what, I had done at Xerox Park and he got all excited. And I said, well, you know, I'm here so I can get access to the frame buffer. And then I said, then I got to talking to Ed. I said, Ed, don't, and Ed told me what he was doing. I said, don't you need help? He says, you can just see the relief. He says, yeah, do I ever need help? Uh, I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm here as an artist, but I also have a PhD in computer science from Stanford. I, I can program. And uh, it looks like you need some help. He's, so he hauled me over to Alex Shearer's office and I got hired. I don't, I guess he construes that as he hired me, but the, whatever. Okay. So I became part of the group. There wasn't a boss. Uh, there was four of us in a room. And um, I remember one day somebody showed up at the door and said, who's in charge here? And we all looked at each other and then we looked at it because far as we're concerned, it was the only one who wanted to be in charge. The rest of us didn't want to be. It was like a university department. I don't know whether you know academia, but nobody wants to be chairman of the department. Somebody has to do it, but nobody wants to do it. Uh, it, was, it was like that. Ed, you do it. Come on. And, and I remember him looking at me as if I was going to make the move to be that leader. Maybe that's what he's referring to. Okay. If, if I'd had that in me, I guess I could have chosen that moment to grab it. But it just that's not the way I work nor the way the group worked. So speaking of how the group worked, like I, one maybe last question I can throw in here is, you know, I, I think, you know, Pixar was so uh, famous for the culture, right? And obviously it sounds like uh, the culture at, and – the, the next, the board meetings was a little different than how you guys work together, right? But uh, who, who instilled that? Who came up with that, you know, really no hierarchy, everyone's working together? How did you guys develop that? Well, I, I think it's because we were really academics. And, and I mean, by we, I mean Ed and me. Uh, to me, that's our proudest achievement, what you just described, is that we, we kept a collegiate. Yeah, somebody has to, you have to have a manager. You just have to, but no super glory goes with that. You just, it's just, it's just structure. You get glory for what you do. And mm -hmm. by the way, one of the things we did not, that I'm really proud of is we did not let this technoid creatives distinction ever arise. I've, I've been places where, the creatives look down their noses at the technoids. Mm -hmm. I've been at places where it's just the opposite. No, 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 no. The way Pixar worked is we had artistically creative people just as noble in their creativity as the technically creative people. Equal mm -hmm. dignity, equal everything. There's none of this looking down your nose at the other type just because they're different. 
We did not allow it. So, you know, Microsoft failed in that front. They they were very much, if you're smart, you program. Otherwise, you do this easy stuff, marketing and art and so forth. No, 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 no. We did not let that kind of thing happen. And Yeah. I think, you know, that was uh, one of the big things. If you read uh, Bob Iger's book, when he talked about buying Pixar, one of the things that he did, you know, he was at ABC when Disney bought them. And he talked about the difference when a company comes in and changes culture and changes things. One of his one rules is like, we're not touching their culture. We're not touching anything. Like they have the best system. They put out hit after hit and we're, we're not going to mess with it. I thought that was a, obviously a super smart move on his part and, Probably. It was. I mean, it's the it's the part I worry about the most. That as we, as the old timer, you know, just, there's only one or two of us left at at Pixar now. Bill Reeves is still there, and uh, probably one or two others of the originals. But you know, basically, we, we we've retired out. Uh, the old culture keepers are are gone, or soon will be gone. I worry about what happens then. You know. But so yeah. far, Pixar's held on to its its uh, unique culture. I think they're just right, right down the they're right down the road for me here. By the way, <laughs> that's cool. Alvy, I have a question about you know in the biography of Pixel is obviously a long journey of the Pixel, which even predates you. And I know um, I've watched one of your other talks, and you talk about how there uh, Schindler. Um, how Schindler yeah, actually saw that. Is in, yeah. incorporated into this whole story. Can you talk about that for a second? Sure. I, I, there, there were surprise, you know, I've worked on this book for 10 years and there were surprise after surprise uh, to me. Here, here, here I am thinking I've, I was born for, before computers. I've, I've watched the entire Moore's Law thing happen. I should know this history inside now. I didn't. So part of the book is to tell the story like it really was, not the not the received stories, which are often flawed. So one of the things I detected early on was there was this group of early contributors to computer graphics who were here, part of the story, courtesy of the Nazis. Uh, my The guy who started, the, my first job out of Stanford was working for a fellow named Herb Freeman at New York University, NYU. Herb was one of the original computer graphics guys. He had been saved from the Nazis as a child by oh, Albert gosh. Einstein. Oh, wow. No, Albert Einstein. Whoa. Albert Einstein wrote three letters to save this kid from unjustly being accused of having TB and got him out in 38 just in time. Wow. He was one of the first guys in computer graphics he hired me, knowing I was an artist, thinking, I'm pretty sure he thought that, he's still alive, by the way, So thinking that because of my artistic interest, I would probably be a good candidate for computer graphics research. And, I, and he kept trying to get me to join the computer. I said, Herb, if you ever get color, I'm there. Because it was still all black and white line drawing stuff in those days. And sure enough, it was just a few years later when I saw the color pixels at Xerox that I made the leap. All right. The second one was, uh, well, the one, let me address the person you're thinking about. The, the first in-betweening program, uh, computer in-betweening program, it was used for Hunger, La Femme, uh, the first uh, computer animation to be nominated for an Academy Award uh, by Marcelli Wine and, and um, Lester Burtnick, I think his name is. You have a remarkable memory. I can't remember what I had for breakfast. You remember nah, years, no, days, you, days. No, no, <laughs> you're, no, no, you got that completely wrong. Uh, <laughs> Terrible memory. But Marcelli Wine, so Marcelli Wine, turns out, lives near my in-laws in Ontario, so uh, Canada. So I call him up. He and his wife came and fetched me, took me out to their island in the Thousand Islands in the St. Lawrence. And we spent a wonderful day together and, gentle this gentle man he tells me his story <laughs> and it was a mind blower his father well f first of all well, he and his father were in the warsaw ghetto the nazis came to haul him off to auschwitz and his father throws the kid aside into the crowd to receiving 
I don't know how I set it up, but there was a woman in the who received the child, Marcelli, and raised him as a Catholic. And later, he was reunited with his father, who had been saved from Auschwitz by being a master tailor on Schindler's List. Isn't wow. that a great story? Amazing. <laughs> uh, it was amazing. So, LV, wonderful, wonderful stories in the book. Amazing. Um, just I want to thank you. It, it's an absolute honor and a pleasure to be with you here. And I want to encourage everyone to check out a biography of the pixel. And there, there's so much, so many good stories. And it starts way back even before you started, which is, you know, you just kind of map the whole thing out. And yeah, it uh, starts with uh, it starts with uh, the French Revolution, actually. So thank you for everything you do. I want to find out how we get our Herb Freeman on the podcast to talk about that story. And, um, but uh, just thank you so much and uh, appreciate your time. And we'll link this up in the, in the notes so everyone can get it. And um, thanks Dr. Scott for being my co-host. Hey, thanks for having me on. Thank you, Alvi. Bye you guys. It was a lot of fun. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.